Hi, I'm Paddy LaBelle and I'm General Secretary of Education and Training Boards Ireland. Welcome to our Future of Education and Training in Ireland video series, where I have a short chat with leading experts from our sector and beyond to get their insights and predictions on the future of education and training in Ireland. Today I'm here with Dara Ryder, who's Chief Executive of AHEAD, which works to create inclusive environments in education and employment for people with disabilities. After graduating from Queen's University in 2005, Dara joined Dunleary College of Further Education as a lecturer, where he became interested in inclusive education while working firsthand with students with disabilities in his classroom. Dara, I understand that you're an ETB graduate from the City of Dublin, ETB yourself, and that you were in Ballyferm at College of Further Education. How did you come to be involved in inclusive education and training? Yeah, well, I suppose, like a lot of people, I think, in this sector, I took a, a circuitous route. Uh, and that's, that's the way with our, our lives and our careers a lot of time, isn't it? Um, I suppose I started, um, my interest in, in, in music is what, first of all, drew me in to become a, a student in Ballyferm at College of Further Education. Mad about music, mad about recording. Any time, uh, chance I could get to really express myself through music, that's what I was doing when I was in school. I wasn't the most academic of, of uh, learners. So I got the opportunity to join Body Pharma as a music tech graduate. And a fantastic experience in Body Pharma there. Met a lot of great people who, who really opened up access to technology and music technology for me. And so after I graduated then from Queen's, which I, I went to after Body Pharma uh, to get a degree, um, I worked a little bit of a, a time in studios and eventually came to doing some teaching in Dunleary College of Further Education. And that's really where my interest in working with learners with disabilities came to the fore. And I suppose I found that that was actually a lot more interesting for me than the subject of teaching music technology in the first place. And the biggest thing that stuck with me from my time there was actually that I was often the barrier as a teacher myself. All sorts of reasons that I never would have considered before I became a teacher, before I began to interact. But lots of things that I was doing in my practice were actually becoming serious barriers to access for those students. So that's really where I became interested in the sort of relationship between disability the environment, the practices, the culture, all of those things, and really how those things can be disabling for people rather than necessarily always thinking about disability as something that's within a person. So that led me to my work eventually uh, in a head, which is really a lot of that now is focused on the whole uh, universal design piece, which is really all about that. It's where we locate barriers uh, in, in the environment. How do you think education and training, bo training boards in general are dealing with disability and with inclusion in particular at the moment? I think a lot of amazing work is going on. That has to be said. Um, you know, we've we made a really strong commitment in the FET sector to universal design for learning in the, the most recent FET strategy. And I think we're beginning to see real dividends in, in how that's playing out now. Really creative classroom practice that's opening the, the door for a lot of students and and really getting them engaged in learning in a way that they they wouldn't have been before. And um, I know I still think there there are gaps maybe that we have to address. And um, especially for example with learners with disabilities, I think we can provide much more consistency with the individualized supports that we provide. You know, and, and so I think we needed to do some systemic work there. And certainly that's an area that ahead is looking at. And um, with ETBI at the moment, we're engaging in a project that's about to start this summer. Um, looking at the provision of reasonable accommodations in, in FET. So we've, we've already done a scoping uh, piece with ETBI, looking at the various policies and procedures that are happening around the country. So that's that's an area we hope to work with ETBI on to, to make improvements in, in the near future. So Dara, what specific part can universal design play in the inclusion of learners and trainees with disabilities? Can you give us a few practical examples? Sure. Well, universal design, I think, can help us to be much more proactive in how we include learners rather than reactive. So rather than trying to make these single changes for single learners, instead, we proactively design to build more flexibility, to build more accessibility, to build more opportunities for learner voice and learner choice right into how we design and deliver programs. So we might think about a very simple example. OK, let's take the exam as, as something that happens in a, in a lot of our further education and training uh, courses. So if we think about exams, they're designed very much to suit a specific type of learners. And often what happens with a learner with a disability is they'll have to do a, an alternative mode of assessment for that. So instead, rather than making that change for one learner, why don't we give every learner the choice of having that assessment? And by doing that, we open up the learning to a whole range of people that maybe before we're completely disadvantaged by the mode of assessment that we may not even have considered in the first place. So universal design helps us to shift us to a much more proactive piece, which enables learners to have more choice right in their everyday classroom experience. How can assistive technology alleviate and hopefully eradicate barriers to participation and achievement for all learners? 
Well, I think the, the power of assistive technology is incredible when you when you see it in action and, and it's everywhere around us now. And often the line between assistive technology and just everyday mainstream technologies is blurring at a very rapid pace. Now, there's a lot of talk at the moment about AI and education, and I'm just really excited. Do you mind if I actually ask the question of ChatGPT instead and see what ChatGPT has to say about it? So I've typed that question in here and here's the response from ChatGPT. It's the examples it's giving about how is it can create accessibility, it can personalize education, it can promote independence, it can enhance engagement and participation, it can boost confidence, it can facilitate inclusion, it can improve accommodation, and it can support diverse learning preferences. And it's gone into quite a lot of detail underneath those bullet points for me. And I'm really excited by this kinds of technology because it gives us the idea of having almost a personal learning tutor in our pockets for maybe the price of a cup of coffee a week. You know, whereas before, if we think about our education system and how the sort of privilege plays into how, how people can progress in education, the access to grinds, the access to additional support, this really democratizes that in, in a really exciting way. And I think what assistive technology uh, can do can really help us to empower people to communicate in ways that work for them. So it can give voice to people who can't speak. Uh, you know, for example, we think about things like through, our pan uh, through the pandemic, when we all moved to Zoom and Teams, building in closed captions so people who, uh, who have hearing difficulties can read on screen or language processing difficulties can also have a, an extra way in to the conversation. So I think there's all sorts of uh, incredible ways that we can do that, that we could, we could have a, a single interview in and of itself on that. But I think uh, it just has such immense power to do that. And it's really exciting because it now lives in our pocket everywhere we go. Okay. So education training boards have responsibility for providing lifelong guidance services in our post-primary schools and through our adult guidance services. What do you think the key tools are for a guidance officer to call on to advise learners with disabilities on future options? I think, first of all, it's really important for our, our guidance officers to ensure that they are disability to work aware of themselves, particularly around the whole area of communication with people with disabilities, to make sure that they can have fruitful and effective exchanges that you know that empower learners sufficiently that's a really important point we talked about universal design already and actually i think that really applies in terms of how we design our guidance services you know we need to think as guidance officers who's not in the room with me and why you know why haven't they made their way to our services a lot of learners with disabilities often come perhaps with, uh, with, with mistrust of our educational power structures, if you like, and things like that. So we need to think about how we invite them in, how we invite people in, into the mode and make sure that they understand that these services are for them you know, in the first place. Okay. So I think those things are really important. We've been very fortunate uh, in ahead to be able to contribute uh, quite significantly to the development of the, the Lifelong Guidance Framework, which is uh, which is uh, in, a, in an advanced draft at the moment. So uh, we're certainly sending that message that, universal design access and inclusion needs to be at the heart of what they're doing in terms of their professional competencies okay and for for guidance counselors because we're talking about them what's the key messages they need to be giving to learners about their future education and training options well the most important thing for me first of all is to set high expectations for our learners because too often in the past people have made assumptions about what people can and can't do and um, based on you know just a cultural bias or anything else. So I think that's the first thing I'd say for all of our guidance counselors, be ambitious for our, our young learners, you know. And um, yes, we want to give them pathways that are going to structured pathways that are going to help them in incremental ways to get where they want to go. But we need to be ambitious for them and make sure that you know they have equal opportunity to, to all of the incredible options that FET and indeed HE has to has to offer our learners. So I think that's the the biggest message I would send to them. So Dara, where is the field of inclusion going? And what are the trends and new areas over the horizon that ETBs should be aware of? I think what we're seeing is we're, we're entering a kind of new phase in, in the work that we're doing in, in access and inclusion. And over the, the last number of years, the last decade or so, we've built a really rich vein of individual practice in our classrooms, in our, in our services. And I think what we're beginning to see now is that we need to look more systemically, you know, in terms of our policies, our procedures, our systems and structures, and really much more tackling access and inclusion in every part of our system, not just in, in the experience that people have in the in their day-to-day -day classroom. So I think that's a, a real a kind of a, a vein that I'm seeing gone where we're starting to see it much more at the strategic level within our ETBs, within our higher education institutions. That's certainly something ahead is supporting at a national level. We're at the moment, for example, we're supporting the development of a national charter for um, universal design and tertiary education, which is a cross-tertiary project looking at how we implement it right across, uh, you know, 
the entire experience. So, for example, we're looking at our digital environments, our physical environments, our supports and services, and our classroom practice. So trying to take a really holistic view and, and, and get how all of these intersecting parts of our uh, learner experience, uh, you know, kind of really matter when you when you address universal design. So give an example of that would be that when students are interacting with the administrative side of a university or a college, that they would be able to have assistive technology there as well. That's yes. the type of thing. For example, we think about um, uh, assistive technologies. Okay, that's one part of it. But to use assistive technologies, we have to have access digitally accessible materials, environments. So it's almost no use talking about uh, digital accessibility in the classroom if someone can't use the website of the college in the first place to actually find out about the courses and engage with them or can't fill in the application form because it's not a digitally accessible application form. So we're trying to connect all the dots between these things and understand that the student life cycle touches all of these parts of the experience. And that's why we need to be much more systemic and, and, and actually involve everybody in the conversation about addressing it and not just our educators in the classroom. Okay. So education and training boards are also employers of teachers, trainers and administrative staff. Is there a key action that we could take today to ensure that we are equal opportunities employers in more than just um, a statement? Sure. I mean, I heard that does a lot of work in this space. Uh, often a lot of our, our FET uh, connections don't, don't know that about us, but we actually have a work placement program for graduates with disabilities. So we have a lot of experience in that area too. Um, I would say like first things first is that having a diverse profile of staff is, is the most important thing you can do. So it's how do we actually do that? How we go about trying to achieve that? I think it's really important for employers, first of all, to send signals wherever they can that they're serious about access and inclusion. So for example, in your job spec, I mentioned the whole piece around digital accessibility before. Have you taken the time to actually ensure the, the materials that you're sending out about the job are digitally accessible? Because in the first place, if people are experiencing a negative experience trying to interact with that, that's going to send them a message that say, actually, this, this place is not for me because it's not taken it seriously in the first place. Equally, we think about, uh, for example, the language we use in our job ads. Have we thought about that and how it might impact on people's, uh, you know, people's interest in a role? For example, uh, someone might talk about uh, the, a, a fantastic ability to communicate. Well, do we mean communicate in different types of ways or do we mean communicate in a meeting setting? Or So being more clear and more specific about what the job actually entails on a day-to-day -day basis can be really helpful. Equally, once we get into the recruitment phase, we need to understand that the CVs of learners with disabilities may look quite different than others. They've often have not had the opportunity, for example, to engage in as much of the in, uh, sort of incidental employment opportunities that a lot of our, our, our young graduates have, you know, to, to work outside their, their learning. Or, you know, for example, to, in our higher education settings, maybe they haven't had a chance to engage with clubs and societies or volunteering opportunities in the way that others might have. And that's something that often jumps out at the page of you when you're, when you're looking at a CV. We have to maybe take a take a more kind of considered approach when doing that. Actually, what, what do we actually need here for the job? And are we kind of designing what we want in terms of our criteria in line with what we actually need? Not necessarily all these uh, bells and whistles that you know may seem to us to, to, to tell us something about a graduate, but actually maybe implicitly uh, applying a disadvantage that we don't understand. So Dara, I'm just thinking about, we've talked about work and teaching, and I'm just wondering about the area of apprenticeships. Is there any advice you can give education and training boards about apprenticeships? And inclusion. Yeah, it's a really interesting area, Paddy. Um, we've been doing a lot of work recently with uh, Fast Track to Information Technology, who coordinate the tech apprenticeships, and we've also um, joined recently the National Apprenticeships Alliance's uh, Equity of Access Subcommittee. So we've been really kind of beginning to delve really deeply into this area. What we found when we were working with FIT is is how how many kind of uh, barriers were in the process of their learner journey that they just had no conception of you know so we actually took that apart in a way it was a shared learning piece they taught us all about how apprenticeships work and we taught them all about how inclusion works in the process so when we mapped out the learner journey we found all of these different barriers uh, i suppose the things we can do quite early uh, in the early process that you know i would say the easy wins for us are you know when we're coordinating tech apprenticeships understanding do we have learner support at the point of entry where we can actually have somebody who's there to support the learner to understand how uh, their disability might impact them in the, the employment space how we can work with the, 
uh, the, the learner and the employer to communicate those needs and create a fruitful kind of partnership around that rather than maybe placing a learner with a disability into that zone where they may be struggling but they may be fearful of disclosing their disability because of uh, because of past experience and so forth so we need to kind of create a smooth processes that help us to kind of communicate those needs and help us to organize the, the support that might be necessary along that journey and it's very challenging in apprenticeships because there is so many different stakeholders the employer uh, the, the apprenticeship coordinator the FET Centre, the, the higher education institution where they often take exams. So it's it's not an easy challenge, but it's certainly something that we can make a lot of progress in. So Dara, is there any event or anything that's coming up for a head that we would be in, we might be interested in education and training boards? Yeah, well, I think, I mean, uh, education and training boards generally have, have really um, come to the party when it comes to UDL. And this uh, autumn, as we always do annually now, we're running our UDL badge program, which is a 10 week program, 25 hours, totally free for uh, ETB educators to, to join in on. So we'd really welcome more and more people getting involved in that. But really, really excitingly this year, we're also launching the pilot of a sister badge, which is called UD Beyond the Classroom. So I mentioned previously that piece about thinking about it much more holistically about, uh, you know, if, if people who are working in an education setting, not in the classroom, but actually have a very important role in the learner experience. So we're launching a pilot program also in October to run alongside that, which is addressing universal design in those contexts. So we're really, really excited about that too. And that's something that we hope our, our FET system will really get on board with. I know that the people who have attended the UDL badge uh, training have really found it changes their, changes their whole approach to teaching. So I'm, I'm really glad that you're doing more for the system in relation to what, you know, broadening the people who are going to be involved in that. So. Absolutely. And it's amazing. We have over 3000 educators in further education and higher education who have taken that badge now in the last number of years. So it's, it's great to see the engagement and to know that every single one of those ed educators is making a positive difference in their learners experience. Well, listen, thanks very much for all the work that you do, Dara, and in particular for the work that you do with, with us in education and training boards. We really appreciate because it is such a part of what we do.